I'm your host, Ward Bond, and I welcome you to another episode of the LCW Music Edition. We have a great show for you today, but before we begin, please head over to iTunes after the interview with my guest today, rate and review the show for me, and I thank you ahead of time for making our show great. Now on to our guest. My guest today is multi-platinum record producer with a storied background and is still producing groundbreaking music. Dito Godwin is a producer, multi-instrumentalist, an arranger, and songwriter. And Dito has worked with Gwen Stefani of No Doubt, Motley Crue, the late great Charlie Pride, Roland Boland, Peter Chris, and Ace Freely of Kiss, Great White, Jack Russell, even Janie Lane of Warrant, Tony Brown, and of course, Winona Judd, and that's just to name a few. While <laughs> Dito has sold over 10 million albums with more coming, and he has shared the stage with Black Sabbath and the Beach Boys, proving his diverse taste in music. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome one of my closest friends, the multi-talented platinum man himself, Dito Godwin. <laughs> welcome, Thank you, brother. Doc. Wow, <laughs> what a nice intro. Man. I, I, didn't, I didn't know I was so famous. You are famous. I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, you know, I always love talking with you. I learn so much. You have so many stories to tell, and we're we're gonna walk through some of those stories today uh -oh. because I know my audience cannot wait to hear of all of the people that you've worked with. But I, I need to throw this out there because it came into my mind as I was working uh, on a lot of the questions and. Your father is actually famous because he was a portrait painter. And can you kind of give us a little background on who your father is or was? Yeah, well, my dad's no longer with us, but my dad was a portrait painter. And um, his work was on the cover of Life magazine. He, uh, he painted Einstein at Princeton University. He painted Sir Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin. He painted General George Marshall during World War II in every hot shot, really big uh, military man. Uh, he painted Pope Paul uh, the Sixth, Pope John the Twenty Third, and he was uh, one of the more known uh, portrait painters of the mid-century. So. He was also an incredible musician, violinist, pianist. Um, he was a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, so highly educated, unlike yours truly. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> big footsteps to fill. But I'm, you know, I'm a Broadway guitar player. There you go. Started. <laughs> well, well, you know, it, so now you set up the story because I was kind of wondering where your musical background came from. And did your, did your father, did he encourage you to get into music or to learn a musical instrument? Yeah, he did. He encouraged me to learn violin. Um, and that turned out to be really difficult because he was, uh, he was a, a protege of some of the greatest violinists in the world, and I was not. And, but I did learn music, and I do love music. And then the first time I ever picked up a set of drumsticks, which freaked him out, uh, or a guitar, uh, so much easier, I hate to say, than violin, uh, I kind of excelled quickly because I, I had already had that musical background. So I don't know that he wanted me to do it for the rest of my life, but I know he was very happy with me playing music because few things make me happier. Oh, man. What a story. I mean, I, I can't even imagine your father sitting down with some of those, uh, I mean, household names. But now we know where the musical, your musical talent came from. But you got your first recording deal in the early 1970s with RCA Records. Uh, how did that happen? <laughs> well, um, I was, uh, I bothered 
Sid Bernstein, who was who was known as the fifth Beatle. He brought the Beatles to this country. He's the biggest manager in the world. And I, I wanted to be represented by him so badly because you always shoot for the best in this business if you can. And I think he took us on because he just wanted me to stop calling. <laughs> and and um, he presented us with the idea of finding a producer and getting our careers going. I got a hold of Sid Bernstein, and he agreed to represent us in a very informal way. We were very young, and he was representing the Beatles and all these enormous bands. And he said we needed to get a producer, so we did. And his name was Bo Ray Fleming, who was a producer, an R&B producer. He produced biggest band, I guess he worked with, is a band called Mandrill. And uh, they were doing very well. And he brought us to RCA, and we recorded an album for RCA, and, and wow, if that wasn't an incredible. So here's the reason it never came out. <laughs> the reason <laughs> we made the record, but they signed this artist named David Bowie, and he recorded an album called Lad and Sane, which is probably one of my favorite Bowie records. So the choice came to RCA is to, whether to release our record, a New York City band, or David Bowie. And of course, you know what happened. Yeah. And But I'll tell you, it was an amazing adventure to be on RCA. It was great bragging rights for a while. Um, but David Bowie is David Bowie, and that's probably my favorite Bowie record, uh, even though that's how we got bumped off RCA. I've never told that story before. But there it goes, Doc. Wow. Uh, you know, David I, Bowie. I, I'm really surprised that a record label would bump anybody. To me, I figured they would just want to get, you know, all of the artists out that they that they would record. I didn't yeah, know you could I'm get bumped you. back then. I wish you had been the president of RCA. <laughs> I could have had an incredible career with that company. But no, um, you know what? Sometimes I've, I've run two record labels and sometimes you have to make a hard decision. And I don't even know if that was a hard decision because we were a great band, but David Bowie is one in a lifetime artist. And so I was actually proud to have shared the same conversation at RCA with David Bowie. And I totally understood. And I moved on and got re-signed, but um, that's how it goes when you're out there playing rock and roll. Well, how did you end up on stage with the likes of Black Sabbath and the Beach Boys? <laughs> well, that's, that's another good question. Uh, we had an agent in New York City whose name will remain nameless, uh, but I can tell you he was on 8th Avenue, if that means anything. And um, we started booking for him as agents. And then every time we booked a date, and these were all major artists, Buddy Miles and Paul Butterfield and all these major artists. Every time we booked a date, they were mostly all colleges, we asked if they had a little money left over for an opening act. And they always did. And so once we had had a whole tour put together with all these major acts, quit the job and did the tour. So we kind of breeded our own work. And uh, we were lucky enough that we played with Seals and Crofts and we played with Buddy Miles and, uh, and the Beach Boys and Black Sabbath. So it was an adventure, but it was a learning experience because not only did we play the gigs, but we made the gigs happen. You know, you've always been a go-getter. And, <laughs> and, and I know that about you. You don't let grass grow under your feet. And I don't. And I like that. I love that type of story because it's not like you're sitting around waiting to get discovered. You go out there and you make it happen. And to actually think of somebody else's budget to make sure that they had something left over that you were going to fill in for yourself. Man, that's just brilliant. That's brilliant marketing and brilliant self-promotion. Well, we never took anything away from the opening artist. I mean, you don't. You don't scrape off the top of the Beach Boys so you can get in and play a 40-minute set. But I said there's a great opening band we'd love to have on the bill, and they were open for it, and that's how we did it. Well, what label are you currently working with at the moment? 
Well, right now, um, I'm working with Universal, which is really the mothership of many labels, of Interscope. Of, you know, it used to be there were tons of labels. Now there's three labels with tons of subsidiaries that are, are functioning record companies. So I have what's called an imprint deal, which is where one record label that assigned directly to Universal will pick up another label and filter them through Universal. I'm one of those guys. And it's wonderful because I'm totally independent. I have full signing power, but I have the biggest distributor in the world. Wow. Now, I know you get this question all the time. So what was it like to work with Gwen Stefani in No Doubt? <laughs> uh, in a word, awesome. I had a friend of mine He's still a great friend of mine who was the head of a and uh, at Interscope. And he was from Britain, but living here. And I was always over there playing artists for him at Interscope that I was producing and just going over there and shopping bands the way we all did back then. And we developed a friendship. So I'm, I'm home one weekend and I get a call and he says, mate, I think I have a little band for you to produce. They're from Orange County and they're doing quite well. And I said, well, who might that be? And he's a little ska band called No Doubt with an unbelievable lead singer. And that was kind of as, as Peter Chris would say, that's history right there. <laughs> and and uh, of course I took the job and we made a record. It was their first Interscope record and it came out great. The band was incredible. Gwen's, you know, she's a star, period. Uh, I started working with her when she was maybe 20, I don't remember, uh, early 20s. And you could tell she was a star right away. And she was, and the band was incredibly prepared. They were on top of their business. They were on top of their music. So the fact that they exploded was absolutely no surprise to me whatsoever. And, and uh, luckily enough, some of those songs on that record did well enough that those songs appeared on about five or six of their other CDs. So it worked out really nicely for me. I, I, I retained a friendship uh, with uh, Tony Canal, the bass player. I retained a friendship uh, with Adrian Young, the drummer, who played on other projects for me. And, you know, I have... Uh, a Christmas invitation to Gwen's house. I guess it's probably been canceled by now. <laughs> but, and I, I remember getting it, looking at it, and go, oh, that's really sweet. Yeah, this was before they exploded. I said, oh, that's really sweet. And I didn't go. I just, I don't know why. I just didn't want to drive to Orange County. I don't know why the reason. But then, then they released the second record, Tragic Kingdom, and it blew up to about 21 million copies. And right after I did their record, uh, they sent me a letter, the sweetest, nicest letter you could imagine. They told me that uh, they loved how I chose all the performances. And they said um, that I made their dreams come true. Wow. And so when I got that letter, I went, oh, wow, this is so nice. And I just kind of put it away. Then, the, then that second record exploded to 21 million and I started scrambling to find that letter. So, <laughs> so all of a sudden that letter became a little gold mine of promo for me and I'm very appreciative of the band. And um, I'm so proud of them. Uh, it's just, it's, you know, my name is synonymous with no doubt, even though lots of other producers produced them and had very successful records Matthew Wilder, a whole bunch of people. I just seem to be the guy. Used to be if you put in No Doubt's producer, I was always the first name that popped out. Well, she mentioned you in her in her book, didn't she? She did. She did. A Simple Kind of Life was the name of the book. And I was interviewed a number of times by the author, uh, Jeff Apter. He was an Australian guy. And, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting situation because a lot of times when bands explode and become huge, they don't necessarily look back at the first guy who produced their record. You know, they look at the guy who did the 20 million 
and I totally understand that. So I was not, I was not, a, I was not a household name as producer uh, in the No Doubt household, but um, I know that Eric, who is Gwen's brother, was on. Um, uh, he was I forgot MTV or or whichever program it was, and he turned to Gwen during a broadcast and he said, "If it wasn't." for the album they did with me, they'd never be there. So I appreciated that. Uh, and uh, it was VH1, actually. I, I appreciated that. And uh, I have a love for them um, that they may not even know about. But they changed my career. And I couldn't be happier for them. And that's kind of the happy ending I had with No Doubt. Yeah, and, and now, you know, Gwen's appeared on, on The Voice. So, you know, her career just keeps going and of course now i think she's about to marry blake shelton so right you know well, you know it's it, it's the gift that keeps on giving for her and she's a star and she still looks beautiful and she can still sing and so i'm incredibly happy for her and i, I don't think i'll be invited to the wedding but i do have a necktie just in case <laughs> just I in case on with this shirt of course oh yeah there you yeah. go well let me and ask you I this will, well, you have, well, you've had an extensive recording work or done extensive recording work with Peter, Chris, and Ace Freddie of Kiss. How did that come about? Um, well, there was a magazine in L.A. and um, they, wrote a, they wrote a story about this little upstart label, which was mine. The name of the magazine was Music Connection. And that's kind of the musician's Bible, or it was for many, many years, because they had all kinds of possibilities for musicians within the L.A. area. And they wrote a, a, a two-page story on me and uh, the gentleman I was in business with. And I guess Peter read it. And he called us, and, and, and my partner came in and said, guess who called? And I said, well, I wouldn't have any idea. It's Peter Chris of Kiss. So I said, really? He said he's interested in wanting to sign with you. And uh, I said, well, I'm interested in signing him. Uh, and, uh, and we did. And a little inside uh, secret for you, Doc, is that we, we signed the contract in Hollywood uh, at a restaurant that's called the Farmer's Market. And it's in a neighborhood you're familiar with because we've dined near there before. Yes. And... Um, when he and his partner, who was the bass player, left the luncheon and signed the contract and they took a nice check away with them, I turned to my partner and I said, whether you know it or not, whether you can see it or not, I guarantee you we just put the original members of KISS back together. And less than three years later, without makeup on, they went and played an acoustic set on MTV on Halloween, and that was the first time they had ever appeared together since the breakup. And so, um, history once again. <laughs> well, you know, I know that you had produced the solo album for Peter Chris and Ace Freely, and I understand the story is, is that Gene Simmons was not too happy about their solo endeavors, but you were the one responsible for that reformation of the original lineup of Kiss. Correct. Well, what? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Almost a hundred percent right. But what I did is, when I first signed Peter, before I could go to my partners and ask to be funded for this, I put out a CD five, an EP, and I did not put it out for sale to the general public. What I did was, I advertised only in Kiss publications, for which there were hundreds, literally, and. We did really well, really, really well. So then we put out the full record. And when I was putting out the full record, I said to Peter, hey, I got a, an idea. Why don't you give Ace a call? And let's have him come and play on this record. And that way the public is getting 50% of Kiss. It's as much Kiss <laughs> as Gene and Paul Stanley. It's the other 50%. Let's make that. I don't want to call it Kiss or, or anything right. like that. But I, I just wanted to have the same numbers of KISS members with us. And that's what we did. And it was successful. I put them out on tour together. 
And uh, after they started getting some momentum, uh, I don't know if it was Gene or Paul put the call in to Peter and said, come on home. And there it was. Wow. That, yeah, that's, uh, that's history right there, isn't it? That's history right there. <laughs> I, I got one more for you, if you like. Yeah, bring to, it on. I, well, I said to Peter, how did this whole thing happen? And he goes, D, I was over at Gino's house, and we were trying to figure out what could we do to make it, to make it like everyone else is making it. What could we do? And they came up with the idea, let's paint our faces either our favorite animal or a hero or something that really meant something to us. And that's how it happened. Wow. Yeah. And the rest was definitely history and, and forever and ever. We'll always be talking about kiss and we'll be listening to all of yes. those records. Yeah. You they know, so well. now was it Peter, Chris and Ace Freddie when they did their solo records, I understand that, um, is, was that part of those four records that everybody remembers of all of their single face being painted or That's was it. these different? No, I believe that was it. Um, I gave Peter a lot more leeway as an artist on his solo record than he had before because I don't want to really get into the politics of it. Mm -hmm. But um, I wanted Peter, I wanted this to be truly his record and not, not through the eyes of somebody else who was not in Kiss. And so I think that was the difference between uh, the other solo projects and the one that I did. Well, I also understand that you were producing, and, and, and the question I'm going to ask you, most people don't even know this. So... You were producing and writing with Janie Lane of Warrant right up to his untimely death. Can you tell us, you know, can you tell us what happened? Not just about uh, I, Janie, but producing Janie. I sure can. Um, I had a friend who was engineering a project of Janie's, and I said to him, do me a favor. I really want to work with this guy because I'm a big fan and he went to his manager. I spoke to the manager and he said, sure, call Janie and see how that works. And I called Janie. We clicked right away. This was in the 90s. It was a project called Jabberwocky. That was his solo project. And we got together. We did four or five songs. And if I was George Martin, he was my Beatles. We just clicked on everything. And I truly got to understand, not that Cherry Pie was not a great song, because it was. And, he, and you know, he also wrote Heaven. That was a number one Billboard hit, which a lot of metal guys or hard rock guys don't achieve, but Janie did. And it was, it, it touched my soul to work with him. His, his talent, I got to know his material. His lyrics were like poetry that a lot of people never heard. So back in 2011, we shoot ahead a bunch of years. 2011, I just had a hankering to work with Janie again. And I called the manager and the manager asked Janie, he said, you bet. As a matter of fact, he was on a TV show with a guitar player he was working with from Alice Cooper. And he said, you know, I was going to go out on the road and do a tour but I'm going to stay here in L.A. and work with Dito Godwin. So, of course, my phone started ringing off. Oh, man, they talked about you on VH1. And, <laughs> and we got together, and he started showing me this material. And our plan was to give other people songs, to save some of the songs for him. We would do a full album. I had a label deal at the time, and, and that's what we were going to do. And so we worked at it and worked at it. And then three weeks later, I got the call that devastated me. And uh, that's how that ended. Well, what, what happened to those recordings? I don't know. I mean, I have all, copies of all of them. And um, uh, what was the TV show that called me? TMZ called me because they got my name somehow. And they knew I was working with Janie and asked if they would let me leak out some material and I said, oh, absolutely not. 
unless I had uh, permission from the family or the manager, or I would never do that. And I didn't. And um, I don't know what's happened with Janie's estate in terms of his music. I, I would be glad to, if there's tracks out there to, to mix, I would be glad to do them and glad to be any part of uh, his legacy. Uh, just people just don't know how in a brilliant artist he was. Now, he was, was devastated me. Well, when he passed, was he married to Bobby Brown? He was not. Oh, he was not at that time. Okay. Yeah. Now, nobody sue me if I'm wrong. Because I asked, <laughs> I it's asked just him. rock history talk. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm safe, right? Yeah, you should be safe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't think he was. But I know a lot of people said, oh, he committed suicide. He did not commit suicide. All we talked about was how excited he was about his daughter graduating and everything was about his daughter. And like everything is about my family. So we, we really clicked on that. So he just had an alcohol problem? Yes. Yeah, wow. severe. Severe. What a great man he was. What a nice man he was. Just he, he had... He had that problem and it took him all the way out. Wow. Well, let's talk about some music business because you're, you and I have had very long conversations about the music business and it's changed quite a bit over the last 10, 15 years. Now, sure you've has. personally seen the record industry go from the glory days to, to the artists now having to survive by touring. Uh, do record sales even exist anymore? And, you know, because I see so many artists right now sending out singles and EPs. And that's what it is. Making a full album, at least in this country. I lived in London a short time ago. And it's a, they're a little more open to the way it was. But it will never return. I think very few artists earn platinum records anymore. Maybe Adele or, or you know. Uh, other a few handful of artists that can sell that many units but that's over the good part is because there is a good part and i've tried to make lemonade as often as possible the good part is that it's a great market for independent artists and a lot of times you don't even need a record label because the ability to reach the masses is right there just depends on how clever you are and how you can connect and your social media skills. It's a whole new language. I prefer the old days. I used to do record promotion all over the country and, and talk PDs and MDs into airtime and, and you know looking for P1 stations. And those, are, those were the glory days of promotion and, and record. And that's not there anymore. And that's what I was trained to do. But I've tried to, you know, you have to reinvent yourself. And I've tried to do that. And now it, it, it is a much tougher world, but it is an independent world. And there's lots of artists who are doing incredible stuff with little to no help from the outside industry. Well, how go? so we know that the whole record sale situation has changed dramatically. Of course, now we have Spotify, Pandora. There's the online streaming that goes everywhere. And anybody can sit at home, produce a song and make an account and pop it up there. Um, besides just the whole record sale situation changing, and like you said, which I'm really kind of shocked, but maybe not shocked that we don't see or hear those big platinum sales anymore. And is there a reason why is it the, the talent pool is not that great? Or is it just because of the way... Um, Radio, you know, radio has changed a big time as well. Uh, you've, you already answered your own question. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's not it's not that there's not a big talent pool out there because there is. There's a lot of incredibly talented people, but there's not the promotion and the record companies drive behind them anymore. So it's self-motivated and there's not record sales. There are streaming services. There are getting music for free. It's very hard to for an artist to make money that way. However, it's not hard for an artist or the way the artist, I believe, makes money today is through merchandise, through personal appearances, touring, 
they can do very well that way. And we've all had to just bend and change. And I was brought up in the, in the world that you were talking about where it was, uh, I knew just how to do this and I'm still figuring it out myself. So I, I'm not an expert on that, but I'm, I'm getting there. And I know that if you put out product, I've always said, Doc, you can't hide a good song. And if there's a great song, it's going to get out there and it's going to happen. I, I, used, I was teaching for a while at, at UCLA, actually, UCLA Extension. And I used to pick the song Betty Davis Eyes as an example by Kim Carnes. And I would tell my students, if I had a nylon string guitar, barely in tune, and a cassette player, and I sat down and I sang that song and played it, it's a hit. Wow. Wow. You know, the thing is about, you know, with radio and feel free to expand on this because a lot of people don't understand how radio actually worked back in the day with artists being played on the radio. Is it still pay to play? You know what? I have not gone out in the world of radio promotion. My, I'm going to guess and say yes. That's just a guess on, on my part. Um, but what we used to do is get in the car, make appointments with program directors, and we would play product. I, I didn't slip any money into anybody's pocket, maybe a couple of t-shirts. And we would get them to fall in love with a particular song. They used to do a thing called Yank It or Crank It. And I did this through Texas a lot because there's a lot of great music in Texas. A lot of radio stations. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and so I, I would go in there and I would play something. And I would try to make the person fall in love with what I was doing and, and my enthusiasm and getting behind the product and telling them how the artist was doing live and how it's starting to come alive. And I would say, please put this on and ask your listeners. And that was my, that was my MO and it kind of worked. Uh, today, I, I think I wouldn't mind having artists that I represent having great big hits on big stations because it still works. It's, yeah. just, not the, it's, it's just not yesteryear where radio was magic and it just seems to have changed. Yeah, now you're just trying to get the song into the hands of someone's smartphone and hope that they hear it. I mean, it's just been amazing how it's changed. Now, you know, as you said, a lot of the labels have uh, subsidiaries. Uh, you have full carte blanche with what you're doing to sign any artist that you want. So what has happened in the industry over the last 10 to 20 years where you had this big money doing artist development and now we don't see that anymore? Sure, so because listen, I ran two labels. I totally, I get both sides because as a record label, you put out a lot of money and maybe 10% of what you put out there comes back. And, and that's why they, if they sign a uh, hundred bands and 10 of them, start to happen. They're all over that 10, but no one's recouping the money that they spent on the other 90. And that's money basically lost a tax write off. However, they do it. I don't know. So it, it's, it's not just the record company being the bad guy, which I always thought it was till I became the record company and I'm not a bad guy. And I was trying to make everything happen for everybody, but it doesn't work out that way. And so now what a record company wants, is they want you to show up. They want you to have a ton of people that are following you. They want you already gigging. They want videos. And then if all of that is in sync, then you might get yourself a major deal. But you kind of have to do the legwork yourself. There's no, I used to go to Capitol Records. Hope you're not listening. I used to go to, and they would give me uh, development deals. Give me a bunch of thousands of dollars. Take this artist in. Let's come back out, see what you got. Play it for them. Okay, uh, it's getting close. Here's some more money. And of course, they have the right of first refusal to the artist, which, you know, if Capitol Records is doing that, what complaint could you possibly have? <laughs> and, that, and that's how we used to do it. And there's no more, I guess it does happen to some degree, but minute. You have to show up locked and cocked. 
Well, isn't that kind of like uh, what had happened with uh, Motley Crue? They had built such a strong grassroots following that they were kind of producing some of the things on their own, correct? And then some record label found them and found out that they just had a huge fan base that they created themselves, and all of a sudden, they just exploded. Jackpot. Uh, I worked with Motley Crue in those days. I worked with them in 81. And I knew a friend of mine said, oh, you got to come down to the whiskey and see this band. All right, I'll come and see the band. I walked in and you would have thought it was like the biggest band in town. It was packed security. I mean, and they had no record. They had a little European distribution deal. They had no record deal at all. And I, I went to the manager and I was like, wow, uh, this is very impressive. And I, I went backstage and I talked to the band. And we were talking about their development as a band that was happening, but no money. I remember Tommy Lee told me, we walked the streets of Sunset Boulevard. We walked the streets like we were the biggest stars in the world and didn't have two nickels to rub together. And, you know, when I've gone on to teach classes, I've always said, act the part, fake it till you make it, however it needs to be done. And yeah, they had this huge, huge following and then it connected and then they exploded. And um, you know what, that, that doesn't happen all the time, but you know, I saw them and I was like, holy, you know what? This is a great band. I mean, so entertaining. Uh, the songs weren't knocking me out, but the show was unbelievable. And I became a fan. I ended up doing promotion for them um, F in the United States and in Canada. And quick note, I can't remember the name of the club in Houston. You would sure know it. And I, I did a, uh, I was on, uh, on a radio promotion tour and I went in there and I had this, I still have one left, a promotion kit of Motley Crue, early Motley Crue. And what we did was, we did uh, like a, um, what would you call it? We, we, we were kind of trying to sell this original Motley Crue thing in order to buy lots of socks for the homeless. Wow. It was cold. And so it was like an auction. I couldn't find the word. It was an auction. I'm, I'm, people... wondering, I'm wondering if the club in Houston was the old Rockefellers. No. Not the Rockefellers? I'm going to have to, no. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to think about I'll, it, and I'll, I'll probably I'll text you, you and say, hey. I'll tell you <laughs> off the air. And it was a wild club. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's some of them still the, still around here. Well, let oh, me ask you no. this. Well, let me ask you this, Dito, because you've, you've ha you have this very expansive career as a producer. You've seen it from, like I said, the glory days. You've seen it now in the streaming days. What are you personally offering today to help new rising talent? That is such a cool question. What I'm trying to do, it's a several prong attack. The first thing is to, what you, you still need in the music business is great songs and a strong image. There are a lot of people who are so talented that don't have the strong image and it's not fair but this is not a fair world. So I try to find someone with great material first, a great image, and then I try to build on that, make a recording and show them or guide them on how to independently get yourself out of there. Because as I said 10 minutes ago, you can't hide a great song. People still love music. And when the world has been in a tough place like it has been, People go to entertainment because they need it. And I think that's why I've been able to stay busy. My son and I have a production company. That's why we've been able to stay busy because people still want it. And so I'm trying to show people how to still do it. If you can't do it the old way and go, can you go get me a deal and get a couple of hundred grand so we can go in and make a record, which would, nothing would please me more. But that's not what they're doing. So I'm trying to educate people on how to do it and how to take them there and get the job done. And I've, I've been successful. You know, that that is so cool and great because I know that you have worked with some young talent. And, 
you know, when someone comes to you, let me ask you this. When someone comes to you, maybe they have a preconceived idea what they want, but you see them, you listen to them, but then you see where they need to, where they truly need to be, or you see where their talent should be. Maybe they think that they need to be some pop star, but you're listening to them, but you're thinking, no, I'm thinking you may be better in country. Does that happen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sometimes you meet resistance and sometimes it's an eye opening because people, you know, if they come to my studio or they see the, a bunch of records on the wall or whatever it is that at least shows I have some inkling of an idea of what's going on, that they will take that into consideration and kind of put it in the mix in terms of their uh, of their own ideas because I don't have an ego at all. I have great confidence. And I tell somebody something, it's not to hear my voice because I truly want to help people. So if I tell them, you know what? You know, that, that, that intro is too long. You know what they say in the music business, don't bore us, get us to the chorus. And so I, I try to form in my mind's eye what's going to help them, not what's going to help me. And if I help myself along the way, then that's cool. <laughs> but the, the idea is I try to give them what I know and, and, and help them on their way because I've been there. You know, you and I have had hours of conversations in the past. I mean, you and I used to sit down in a little restaurant, a little famous restaurant in West Hollywood <laughs> and... And I would literally just sit there and just listen to every word you would say, not just the stories, but talking about production, talking about artist development. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching this right now, maybe you're sitting here thinking, how in the world do I get from where I'm at right now to where I would like to be? Man, if it was me, I'd be calling up Dito Godwin and say, hey, what can I do? Hook up with the man and learn something. Because it was kind of funny when you were telling the story about going to all of the different radio stations. When I'm in your presence, even right now, when you talk, people listen. There's And, and like you said, it's not bragging. You have a confidence that I rarely see in today's music industry. You know, most people are like, they walk around with a wish, like they're wishing. You just get out there and get it done. Well, first of all, you were so wonderful. Thank you, Doc. And I enjoyed every single one of those meals, and I'm looking forward to it again. We're going to be doing um, it again. <laughs> I sure hope so, and I hope soon. Uh, you know what it is? It's just if I see something work, I keep it in, I keep it in my, my bag. If I see something not working, I'm always, and I've also learned in my old age now, it is so much better to listen than to talk. And I, I learn so much from people and I, and I try to, you know, I've been a Beatle fanatic for years. And one of the things I loved about the Beatles the most and still do was their production ideas. And though I don't make Beatle records, I try to borrow something. The Beatles, when they made a mix, when they, no, no chorus was ever the same. There was just a slight movement, a slight change. And so I try to take what I can from all the success I've heard and been around and learned from other people. And I just try to bring that to whomever I'm working with because that's what they're paying for. And I want to load them up with as much confidence as I can possibly do. When I get an artist in my studio, what I say to them, the lighting I use, whatever it is, I try to make them feel in my studio, whether it's the lighting, the words I use to bring out a performance from them. I try to take the pinnacle of their ability and get it out and capture it in a recording. The best guitar solos I ever played in my life were in my room with nobody listening. They weren't on record. They weren't jamming with friends of mine. I play and I go, gee, that sounded good. Of course, no one will ever hear it. And so I want to make sure when people do that, somebody does hear it. 
Yeah, I love that. And, you know, man, you know, your stories, you know, you, you've lived the stories, you, you've been on stage, you know every element of the, the record industry from the past to the present. Um, you know, it's just, I know there's so many new young artists. And, and it's funny, when I started <clears throat> this Music Edition show, one of the things that, uh, or one of the conversations that I got into with many of the music publicists were, it wasn't just promoting the well-known, the iconic legends or the current stars. It was, what can we do to get the rising stars out there so people will start listening to their records? And that's one of the things that we've done here is to kind of play a part in you know, showcasing some young rising talent because, you know, it's not easy like it was in the old days. Uh, you're completely right. And my sights are set the same way as yours, Doc. I like to take a new artist and just turn them out so that people will, uh, people will enjoy what they do. And you know what? Musically, we all learn from each other. We only have notes A through G. That's it. You, me, Paul McCartney, Beethoven, that's all we got. And it's how we mix those notes up that make the melodies and make the music. And so that's not, a, you know, that's that's a, a tall order. And so I, I try to encourage new artists to get out there because you're as good as anybody else. You know, I look at these platinum records in my living room and I said, gee, those are nice. But you know what? I'm a guy from New York who played in a bunch of bands and I push, 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 did it happen? And I was just with um, Ralph Johnson from Earth, Wind & Fire, the drummer who is a magnificent human being, by the way. And we went and we looked at his kind of a little uh, studio in the, in the basement of his flat and on a shelf was seven Grammys. And I was like, oh my. <laughs> And he said, I said, God, you're, you're incredible. And he said to me, you know what? I'm just a guy who answered an ad. Wow. That's, I will never forget that. That is crazy. And that's how it happens sometimes. You know, it's, and that's how it happens. It's, it's literally not the glory, you know, the glorious stories. It's just like, hey, I picked up the phone. I called somebody or I... You know, I just happened to walk into a rehearsal and history happens. Can I give you one more kiss, Diddy? Yeah, please do. Like? Yeah. Well, probably, if not their biggest song, one of their biggest was a song called Beth. And as a matter of fact, my wife's name is Beth, who you know. And when I had Peter in the studio, he used to call her up and sing it to her, <laughs> which I thought was terribly nice. But Beth was written on a subway on his way to Brooklyn. Wow. It was yeah. actually called, it was actually called Beck and the producer changed it to Beth. So there you go. <laughs> Some underground <laughs> kiss. Stuff wow. Written you know, on a, written on a subway. Well, it was good for the producer to change the name because it's yeah, still, I think it was it's, Bob, Bob it, Ezrin. I'm not sure. So don't quote me, but well, let me I ask mean, you this. It's amazing. Well, my last question is, what does the future hold for Dito Godwin? Watching my grandson grow. <laughs> that's number one. I'm sorry. I'm so proud of him. Oh, That's number one. Uh, you know what it is? I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I love to play and produce music. I love to help people achieve their dreams. Um, that's what no doubt said to me, I helped them achieve their dream. And they just clonked it right on the head. Not because, you know, for any other reason other than that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Now, that's it. For, for, for everyone watching, for any rising talent that would love to contact you, uh, where can they go? Well, they can go to Dito Godwin, D-I-T-O, G O D W I N dot com. All right. Well, That's it. well, well, brother, 
I have got to come out to L.A. You and I have got to get together. I miss you. I, I miss I, I the miss family. I miss you something terrible, Doc, and I love your family. And, you know, we've known each other a long time. And sometime I'd love for you to interview my son, who is so up and coming, such a great producer, unbelievable guitar player. Well, B Bernie and I have our own story, so uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to make that I'm going to make that happen because if it wasn't for me interviewing Bernie backstage when he was with the Stick People in Houston, Texas, you and I would have never met. So, do you know the club backstage? Yeah, backstage. I think we call I think we call it backstage live or warehouse live. That was the club I did the Motley Crew giveaway and wow, and people. I, I couldn't think of the name. I was too. I think it, the, I know Warehouse Live is is still here, and uh, yeah, it, it, I think uh, standing rooms probably about five hundred people. But I actually saw um, I saw Black Label Society over there. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I saw Malmsteen. Man, I saw a bunch of metal bands over there. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, you're the man, period. I, I am a huge fan of yours. I thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, you do great things for people, and bless you. That's it. Hey, brother, I love you, Dito. I love your family. You tell Bernie and Beth in August, and tell that grandkid of yours hello. And, and Kate, I'm not going to forget Kate. And you're the uh, man. And man, I'm, I miss Seamus. I miss Seamus. Oh. Bless you. I, I miss him. My heart's broken. Yeah. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Seamus up there. Yeah. Well, for those of you who do not know, Seamus is was Dito's Saint Bernard, and I remember when he was a puppy, and uh, always always waited for the photos on Instagram just so I could follow yeah. along. Yeah. Wow. All right, brother. Well, ladies Thank and you, gentlemen, Doc, so much. You bet. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's Dito Godwin, multi-platinum record producer. Go to DitoGodwin.com. And remember to catch every episode of the LCW Music Edition. Just hit subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. And if I can ask you a favor, please take 30 seconds and rate the show on iTunes. Thank you for doing that for me as we want to bring you the best show possible. Just look up LCW Music Edition on any streaming service. So thank you for watching today's episode. This has been a LCW Music Edition, the place that brings you the legends of music, today's current artists, and the most talented rising stars. See you next time.